it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Nick Walker, who, uh, please don't hold it against him, is also one of my oldest friends. Um, but Nick is an actor, cinephile, and theme park nerd. Currently leading the Broadway cast of Ain't Too Proud after three years as Aaron Burr in the Broadway and touring companies of Hamilton. He's also been seen in Motown the Musical, Peter and the Star Catcher, which was fantastic, and on, Law, uh, on TV um, in Law and Order SVU. A writer and content creator, he is the playwright behind the Bloody Boston Trilogy, co-host of the talk show The Chaos Twins on Broadway World, and his movie podcast, Little Justice, is streaming with the Broadway Podcast Network. In the free time between all of this, Nick also teaches at NYU. Everybody, please give a very warm uh, school to career welcome. To it is. Uh, hi. It, hi, everybody. Hi. It is, it is uh, first of all, good to see uh, your lovely faces. It is so strange when you have your bio read back to you uh, because you realize, you know, there's apparently somebody who's done a lot that, that's about to speak. And it's, you know, you have to live up to that expectation. I, I, I cannot do that. Um, so, you know, we're going to have a very honest conversation today. Um, but I was so happy when Jeremy um, came my way to do this with you guys, because I, I really do love talking to people your age and seeing where you're at. And that's kind of, you know, if there's one theme that I can lay out today is that I, I really, yes, this is a present. Presentation. Yes, this is a, a speaker series, but I want this to be a conversation. So I, I, I noticed Jeremy saying, you know, think of questions, please think of questions. Um, because if there's anybody who is interested in the arts in any way, um, I want to be able to help you um, in whatever way I can uh, give you specifics about how this thing works. Um, so if there was one theme about what I wanted to talk about today, it's, it's the sense of we can call it a sense. The lie that we are told often in this society is that we are not enough, especially uh, those of us who are uh, people of color are told that we are not enough, that we do not have enough to do what it takes, um, that our voices are not enough, that our bodies are not enough, that the amount of money we have is not enough, that our attention spans can't hold long enough. We are told all these things and these things are perpetuated and all of a sudden we are blamed for many things and we are uh, put down for many things. And uh, I've had a very interesting ride, but a very interesting ride. The core of which has been learning and believing in myself um, and trusting that I am enough. So I'll take you back to the beginning of, of this ridiculousness uh, called my life. Um, not my birth, it's too far. We're gonna start, probably start at uh, like high school. My, my love of theater and my love of acting started when I was really young. My mom uh, believed that I had ADD and she had heard that theater would focus me. And hold on to that one because many years later, um, I'd say as recently as two weeks ago, I would fully understand that I did have ADD um, and that I do, you know, <laughs> need medication. Um, and that's the thing that we will definitely talk about. But at the, at the time, back at this, you know, this juncture in my life when I'm like, you know, five, six, seven years old, all I know is I have a lot of energy, very little focus, but the one thing that focuses me is stories and storytelling. Um, I don't know if you guys can use the, the 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 features in your in your Zoom, but if if there's any way to raise hands or put it in the chat, uh, I was I don't know if anybody was a, a Steven Spielberg fan growing up or a Quentin Tarantino fan growing up or a Spike Lee fan growing up, but these were movies that like these were my babysitters. My mom had a job where she was uh, away, you know, most of the evening, so I would come home and do my homework, and then I would watch movies. I would watch movies all the time and I would read all the time and um you know where I met Jeremy at summer camp I I was uh this camp that we went to was this amazing place full of storytelling and full of it's full of arts and, and you really could kind of nurture these these gifts and 
I, you know, I, by the way, your teacher, Jeremy, you know, he was kind of, he was kind of like the heart prob in, uh, it did, and yes, does acting help with your, yes, it does. We'll get back to that. But, but acting does help with my ADD. Um, but Jeremy, on, on Jeremy for a second, Jeremy was kind of the heart throb of this, of this campus. And uh, he would go around, he'd be playing like guitars and he had his hair, his hair was dyed green. And I, I was going to bring a picture of this, by the way, but I didn't want to embarrass him that much. It was very, it was, it was really, you know, wonderful to see, but, but we were both, I think we were both very artistic souls. And that was, I think, one of the things that, that, that spurred our friendship was this love of the arts and this love of, of poetry. And, and we would, we would do, we would write poetry and we would do stage combat and like, you know, we had no, we had no training for stage combat, by the way. We were just, we literally were just fighting each other, uh, looking like idiots in the quad of this camp. Um, but it was super, it was, it was just such a great time to kind of explore these, these artistic tendencies. And what I found was that the arts, and, and this kind of goes back to, to your question, um, Trinity, the arts and acting did help with my ADHD. Um, it was, it, it eventually became the one thing that I could do where I didn't get overwhelmed. There's so many things that happen where I, I, I just, like my brain just kind of fogs up and I get, I, I go into the space where I'm just like, I, you know, I don't know. But if you put a script in front of me, if you put me on a stage, if you put me on a set, like, it's like, it's like, I'm just zeroed in. Now, what I've had to work on in my life has been getting getting that same focus to other aspects of my life but again we'll come back to that so i'm doing these arts and uh i'm i'm you know even at a young age i was writing like you know i was trying to write like rock operas and plays and um and yes it does affect me with well we'll get to the lines because we'll talk about we'll talk about remembering lines um because it does but in a in a very specific way so, you know, I'm, I'm doing all these cool things, just trying to figure out who I am artistically. I get to high school. High school is a place that they, uh, I, I, was, I went to this place called Brookline High School, uh, and they were big on Shakespeare. They were big on, um, on like, really cool, like, kind of cutting-edge work. And that was a lot of the reason for that was because of the teachers at that school also had a theater company downtown. So they would teach during the day and then they would do this theater company at night. And this theater company is called Company One and it was all about arts for people of color and arts and, and pushing the boundaries of theater and all this stuff. So that was very much the stuff that I grew up on. I wasn't, you know, we all did the, the, the musicals, uh, but I was always, I always kind of had a dark streak. Like I always, I, I really wasn't feeling like the, the kind of the, the big splashy things. I, li I liked the, the character stuff. I liked the things where you could really dive in and figure out who these people are psychologically. And um, that, you know, <laughs> that I was very fortunate because that's kind of what my school did. We didn't do anything, uh, you know, kind of on the straight and narrow. We very much tried to push the boundaries as much as, you know, we could, um, you know, because you have parents coming with their camcorders just wanting to see little Billy do his little dance. And then, you know, we're up there like, you know, like our West Side Story, both Maria and Tony died. Like, you mean, like it was, it was crazy stuff. Like we were just doing crazy things. Um, and, but it really fostered in me this love of art, of, of the power of art to stick people in a darkened space and tell them a story that connects them. And that carried on with me to college. And when I didn't, I was not smart about my college process. I, I did not look at, uh, as many schools as I should have. I literally had one school. It was NYU or bust. That was, I was where I was going. And, um, and it was crazy because I think back and I'm like, wow, that could have really not worked out. Like that, act, like truly, I think that I'm like, cause my, my mom, my mom was saying like, Nick, do you want to look at any of the schools? Do you want to, and like, guys, I didn't do research. Like I didn't research. All I knew was that this school was in New York, that it taught theater and film that's it. That's a little, I was like, yeah, that's, that's enough. Um, so I was, yeah, I, I applied early decision and by, you know, by some miracle I got in and, um, and it, it was a really amazing time. Um, but you know, I think, I think the thing that I learned there was the cost of, of this, of art. How would I rate NYU? <sighs> 
here's the th- I, if you're looking for an education in the arts okay nyu is a is a very very good school to go to that said there are and i'm I'm, I'm, I, 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 I teach there now, so I have to be careful about saying this, but I, what I will say costs far too much, far too expensive. Um, there's, there's no justification for how much they're charging students. Um, and so if you're gonna go there, I highly suggest, I look into scholarships because that's what I had to do. Because it's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. And the way they get away with it is that they're, you know, you're in New York, so you're you're living in these amazing dorms that are like that. You know, they don't tell you, but they're in this prime real estate of New York. Um, so if you're going to do it, that's actually one thing I would suggest is go there early, get to know the city, and don't stay don't stay on campus because New York is your campus, and that's going to say that that ended up saving me thousands of dollars, um, which was very helpful. But yeah, NYU was very much about breaking me. That was that was kind of the story of NYU. NYU, you go there as an actor, as somebody who you know is is studying acting and that craft. And the first thing you hear is that everything you know is wrong. And and it, at the time that I went there, they proceeded to do all these things that were like any like uh, psychological trickery. Like all these, all the things that you hear about with acting school where it's like, wow, that, that doesn't happen. It happens. And it happened to me. Like, so for instance, there's this, there's exercise that they, you know, had you do called go, your trip to China. And the, the whole idea of it was that you come in, uh, your homework is to create a vacation in your mind that you took to China. And you're going to come in with those details and the teacher, the professor is going to teach you how to create those memories for yourself, right? So that you can, your character, whatever character you're playing, ostensibly has these memories to access. Now, cool, great. You know, they did this specifically for people like me who are like kind of class clowns. Class clowns because we thought we were smart and so we didn't think we had to pay attention. So inevitably me and all my friends would be like the first people to go and we would come in with a memory of going to China like yeah and we're just trying to get a rise trying to make make people laugh um we'd be like yeah 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 you know we went to China and uh and we we stepped off the plane and we got mugged and then we got stabbed and then we got locked in a dungeon with by like we were just being ridiculous and so then Ron this this professor would send us out of the room okay thank you you come back in the lights would be completely dark. You don't know what's going on. All of a sudden, you feel like a very large person who was Ron, our professor, like shoved you up against school. He's like, give me all your money. You're like, what? He's like, give me all your money. And like he proceeds to like take your wallet. And then he, you, what's the next part of your memory? He's like, you get you get your clothes stolen. So then he's like, take off your clothes. And you have to like, you're stripping down. Like it, guys, it got crazy. It got crazy in these classrooms and to this day or not to this day because they don't do it anymore because thank god um but when you when i when i was a senior you would walk the halls and you would always know that it was ron's class because you'd see some poor freshman like crying like oh my god what just happened to me and you're like oh you had ron's class didn't you yeah yeah, yeah. that's messed up it's messed up so <laughs> um nyu um and why you and answer your question, Michael, it is absolutely focused on cinematographers and directors as well. Um, I was in the acting track, so that was my focus, but they absolutely have a film school that does uh, directors, screenwriters, cinematographers, producers, everything. So that it is a place where you can go. And those, those tracks I have heard are actually pretty incredible um, as well. So some to look into if that's what you're interested in. Mr. Nick, uh, just a quick question for you. Yeah. Um, so, um, because I know Michael wants to be um, a filmmaker and wants to go yeah, to yeah. film studies, um, and I know that he and Nikoi both are very talented um, in their fields, which are both very artistic. Did you, the people that you knew in the either cinematography or uh, directorial tracks, did they have similar experiences to the actors being broken psychologically like that or you know with film and with with film 
on the film track, it is a very different track because you're dealing what you're, you know, film is all, as you guys know, film is all technical, right? That's, that's what film is. Film is on film is actually understanding. It's something, here's what's hard. Acting is such an objective thing, right? Acting is about your body and your vessel and your voice and, and knowing yourself. Film is similar, but you, you actually can study these, you know, the, especially if you're talking about cinematography, you can study techniques, language of film, you know, script analysis, film analysis. There's entire YouTube channels um, devoted to this, which if you, if you guys aren't already looking at lessons from the screenplay, um, the take, there's a ton of them that I can put in the chat for you guys. Cause they're, they, they, I love them. And they help me as I get into film, um, you know, but yeah, it's, it really is. I, t so I teach uh, script analysis, actually a uh, scene study and script analysis. Um, so it, it really is, uh, I think for filmmakers, a great school and it is for actors too. When I was going there, they were very dramatic and, and I, I do not teach like they taught me. Um, I, I, I may, I take what I like from that, but I use other things. Um, but fast forward, you know, I graduated college and uh, I get out and the first thing that's happening, and like, again, I, I, I got a really, I got a $200,000 education. Do you know what I mean? Like this, it's, it, it was, it was, it was a, an incredible education. And there's a cockiness that comes with that. There's an expectation of, oh yeah, I'm gonna get out there. I'm gonna book everything right off the bat. I had friends who were booking TV shows, movies, Broadway, all this stuff. My first job out of school was children's theater in the back of a nine foot by 13 foot van. And I was on the road for six months and I was uh, traveling to places like Oshkosh, Wisconsin, which if you haven't been there is actually a lovely town, one road. Um, and you're getting dressed in cafetoriums. I was not aware that cafetoriums were a thing. I didn't know that. Uh, where the cafeteria is also the auditorium. It's a great thing. Uh, you know, getting your costume on the cafeteria in the in the like next to the Elio's pizza, and then going out and doing whatever the play is, and you build the set yourself and all this stuff. Um, you know, so it it really. Uh, it really was kind of a, an eye opener when I first graduated and um, yeah, I definitely, yeah, what I teach is a popular major, I, like, because it's part of the acting track. Um, so we will, and I promise we will circle back to that, because that's, that's kind of where the story, where the story ends, or at least for now. Um, so I was out there, and all these people were booking, and that was really the first major time that I felt like I was lacking. Like, I felt that, that these things, uh, I was not worthy of these things. And it was a feeling that, that I got familiar with because it was going to permeate throughout my entire life. This idea of you are not enough. It also didn't help that at the time that I came out into the world, the choices for black actors were not that varied. It's actually pretty crazy to think about, you know, I, I go back, because I've had the same email since I was a since I was a, out of college, and I go back to those first auditions that my agent was getting me. I can't tell you how many like my first TV role was a was a football player. Guys, I've never played football in my life, in my life, have never played a game. Um, but those were the roles that were being given at the time. Like we we were very much in these. You're the athlete. Maybe you're the the you know the 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 best friend lawyer of the main lawyer. Maybe you're the whatever. You know Broadway wasn't that different. Broadway, you you know you usually had one or two ensemble members just to make it feel diverse. Uh, you know it was very much just seen through one gaze, and it was very disheartening. And I remember just having a lot of days. I lived on 105th and First. Uh, me and my, my two roommates, um, and we were all going, it was, you know, these three young black men living in Spanish Harlem, trying to make it as actors. I worked at City Sports uh, in New York City, uh, which is a Boston company. That was my side job. My friend Alan worked at Ralph Lauren on Fifth Avenue, and my friend Paul also worked at City Sports. 
and we would we would we we're all three actors trying to make it and we'd come home and just be like yep never gonna happen um and remind me to tell you what alan is doing now because because he he actually I mean, all, all three of them paul is an amazing filmmaker and alan is is an amazing actor but like it's funny we we text and we're like thinking back to those days and it, it was very real and you just you just felt like god this is not going anywhere and and why I'm bringing this up is I, I just want to let you guys know that, yeah, it's it's not easy, right? It's not this thing that is just handed to you. It doesn't just happen. Even I'm a, I, I truly, I really think I'm a very talented dude. I really do. And I've been able to uh, sustain my, my life on acting for, for now 10 years. I haven't had since city sports. I haven't had one side job. I haven't had anything. I've just acted and wrote and written, right? That said, that took me to get to this point has taken me tw all those years. And every time that a job ended, I was right back at zero. So the first big break that I had was, um, this kind of crazy thing. And this is the, the lesson of this story is, is be nice, <laughs> be kind. So when I was in college, uh, my friend, Luke Humphrey, he was my, uh, my good, good friend um, in acting school with me. His godfather would come in and take him out for dinner. Um, and his godfather, I, I didn't, I knew that he was from Canada. Um, He's a very kind, kind of eccentric dude. And he and he would, all I knew was like, I was a poor college student. This man would come in and take us out for dinner to like this place called Spice, which is in like the meatpacking district in New York. And this man would be dropping easily $500 on dinner, easily. And I was like, wow, Luke, who is your godfather? Because that's insane. And he'd be like, oh, he's, he's a director, he's a director. Come to find out, this is Des Mackinoff. Des Mackinoff is the the director. Uh, he he, if you know, like if you any of you are theater heads, uh, Big River, uh, the Who's Tommy, um, Jesus Christ Superstar. I mean, this is this is all him, his stuff. And this is just Luke's Godfather. Found that out much later. So when I got out of school, I wasn't really trying to audition for musicals. I was just like trying to work. Um, but I did, I love, I loved musicals. I, 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 but it had to be musical, like I said, you know, back going back to my high school days where I could act. Like I didn't like just like frivolity, whatever. Des was directing this revival of Jesus Christ Superstar on Broadway. Um, I went in for it. My agent sent me in. I got right when you, for, when you audition for a show, uh, when you're young, when you're green, the casting directors first, they screen you, right? You don't just go in and it's not like on like this TV shows where you go in, it's like the whole team there. It's actually, it's a lot of steps. It's maybe like seven or eight auditions, especially when you're starting out to book a job, right? Because the first thing is the casting director sees you and is like, okay, interesting, cool. Is this someone who I want to pass on to, you know, let's say the music supervisor and the assistant director? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Then you get seen by the assistant director, the music supervisor. Okay. They like your work. They're going to give you notes, come back, you come back and work with them again. And then after that, you're going to get seen by the director and then the director is going to give you notes and you're going to work with him or her. And then after that, you come back in for your final callback, which is producers, directors, the entire team, right? It's about 10 people, 10 to 15 people sitting in a room for you. So I get to this final callback. And I see Des, and I was like, Des? And he's like, oh, my God, Nick, blah, blah, you know? And I hadn't seen him in, you know, three, four years. And it was like this great catch-up session. And he said to me, he's like, hey, I don't think this is right for you. Now, keep in mind, guys, I've been auditioning for this at this point for a year. And I get to the final thing. I know the guy. And he's like, I don't think this is right for you. However, I have a show, a new show that I'm doing at La Jolla Playhouse, um, it's, it's by this crazy psychedelic rock band called the Flaming Lips. It's called Yoshimi Battles of the Pink Robots. Um, you know, just listen to the album when you get a chance. Listen to the album and, and, and I'll, I'll hit you, I'll hit your, your agent up and we'll talk. Okay. 
Uh, so I listened to the album. I love the album. It ha- I actually knew, I realized I knew the album from, uh, from different places. Um, but <laughs> I get a call from my agent. It's like, Des, Des and the producers want to meet with you for Yoshimi. Okay. I go in. I literally, it's, it's not even an audition. It's, it's just like a, we sat and like caught up about like how my life was, what working at City Sports was like. Get a call the next day. Yeah, Des wants you. Uh, you're leading the show, uh, Yoshimi. Um, I was terrified. This was my first. So the way that Broadway shows work is you'll do an out of town tryout, right, at a place like La Jolla or or, um, em- uh, oh my God, Jeremy in Boston. We have one. We we the, the Huntington. Yeah. Um, uh, or ART. Right there's there's all these different places in the country. I think Pittsburgh has a place too that I'm, uh, I want to say it's the CLO, but it might be different. But uh, there are theaters that these people will try out their shows before taking it to New York. And so that was I had gotten this tryout on this show. Now this show, the basic premise of this show was um, this young woman. Um, I'm typing just to see if I can find a find a, a cool picture of this because one of my favorite things i might throw in the throw in the chat uh this young woman uh is in this battle or she's not a battle but a love triangle with uh three of her or two different boyfriends right her, her current boyfriend me and her ex-boyfriend and in the middle of this love triangle she comes down with cancer and we imagine her battle with cancer as this battle with these giant pink robots some of the most insane things I've ever seen on a stage ever in my life. Um, I, I, I was like not really prepared. Here, let me see if I can do this share screen. Yeah, there we go. Just to show you guys some of the, some of the clips from this. Here, let me see. Oh, that's not what I want. Where'd it go? It's there. There we are. Yeah, there we go. So that's that's our show right yoshimi so like literally 30 foot tall pink giant robot on stage um (laughs) there's me as a young young man um so that's me and my friend paul and kamiko in the corner there um kamiko actually went on to do orange is the new black so if you know that she's also in spider-man to the spider-verse um so she's been she's been killing it as well but that show was like, it was like this crazy thing where we were on stage and there was $20 million of technology around us at any given time. And I, again, this was like my first, I, I was leading this show of, of massive things. And, you know, Des has a very specific directing style. Des's directing style is, um, he's cinematic on stage. He wants stillness he um he wants you know he wants the stage picture so naturalism moving your hands a lot he's not about that he's very much about being just being present being present and and speaking truthfully but i was 24 and thought i knew better and so he set the show and we opened the show and then halfway through the run of the show i started like me and kamika were like oh let's try this let's try this let's do this and here's the thing when you're doing a long running show you, it's not, you know, everyone asks like, is it, but you're doing the same thing every night. It's not the same thing every night. Um, it's at a certain point acting is like jazz, right? At a certain point, yes, there's the structure of what you're doing, but you're throwing the ball back and forth in a way that you as the audience might not understand that it's different from what we did the night before. But we as the actors on stage know that we're doing something to keep it fresh for ourselves. So there is, there was a middle ground we found. I gilded the lily and went way over that middle ground. And Des saw the show, and I'll never forget this because my my high school teachers had flown in to see this. The night that they flew in, Des was also there. And I come out of my dressing room and I come into the lobby and I see my teachers right like there. And I'm just like beelining them. And then all of a sudden from out of nowhere, Des comes up the stairs like, what the heck was that? What were you, like just like, yells like and again you have to understand number one i did not con- not condoning what des did at all because he's a pause since apologized for it not right but des is old school des is like des is like comes into the he you know he's like he's like stanley kubrick coming into the rehearsal room with like a you know a fedora and a scarf and walks in and is very kind to everybody but he's expecting one of the assistants to take his scarf and take his hat that's des 
you know what I mean? So he was livid that I had done this, that I, that I, you know, messed with his vision. I cried in the parking lot. I was like, just done. I was so embarrassed. He pulled me aside the next day. He apologized. And then he was like, what you're not doing is you're not trusting that you're enough. I cast you because you standing on stage, you just standing, you just breathing is interesting. People would pay to see that. So just be there. Just be present. That's it. That's all I want you to do. And it was a huge turning point in my, in my work, in my life. Again, I, I don't agree with how he did it. I really don't. And I've told him this. But it's so true. And, and from that point, my work became much more subdued, much more intimate, much more focused, detailed, personal. Fast forward a little bit. I've done, you know, uh, uh, Yoshimi doesn't end up transferring, right? We, we, do the, we do the out-of-town tryout. People love it. It's just too expensive. <laughs> it's too, as you, you know, it's too expensive to bring. And people, you know, especially at that time, people weren't willing to take a gamble on anything, um, you know, it was, it was, and it's sad because like, it was such a good show, you guys, like, I really miss it every day. Um, you know, I film, I film some Law and Order, I do some, I do a little TV here and there. And then I made my Broadway debut in a show called Motown. And uh, Motown was a hot garbage fire. I, I love, and I, you can ask anybody who was in that show, we will tell you the truth. That show is really a mess to work on. Um, but it was a Broadway show and people, and people loved it and people love Motown music. And so we had a blast. Um, but I go out on tour with Motown and I go out on tour with Motown because, uh, I just wrapped a play out in Denver, but now I had met my wife about eight years ago and it was time to get married and I need to help pay for my wedding. So I was like, I know the show is trash, but I will take this paycheck. And so I went out and did Motown on, on the road. And uh, at this time, there was a, my, I'd gone to lunch with my buddy Oak and um, he was, you know, we'd always, when, when you're, especially as black actors, you're always like crossing paths. Like we all kind of know each other. We all kind of support, you know I mean? Like really because you don't want to be in competition, right? These, these, these people are doing the same thing you're trying to do. Like, how can I support my brother? How can I support my sister? How can I, how can I have you, have you back? And so me and Oak, <clears throat> before I left for tour, I took him out for lunch at a sushi place and he was talking to me about the show that he was doing down at the public theater, which if you don't know, it is this off Broadway theater in New York written by written by the, the, the he's like, yeah, it's, you know, the, in the Heights guy doing like this show about like founding fathers, but like we rap, we're doing hip hop. And I was like, I mean, that sounds weird. Like it straight up just sounds like a weird show. He's like, dude, I know. I don't think this is going to do anything. I was like, yeah, well, but you know, but that's the game, right? Like I just done Yoshimi, put $20 million into Yoshimi. It still doesn't happen. So like the game is you go and you try it and hopefully it hits. But if it doesn't, like we go on to the next show. So I'm like, yeah, you're going to be fine. Like just enjoy your run and we'll see what happens. I go do this play out in Denver and then I go do the tour. I come back to New York and Oak's face is on billboards and everywhere is just Hamilton. Hamilton. I'm like, what the hell is this Hamilton? Now, truth be told, I had been going in for Hamilton for a while because I knew it as the Hamilton mixtape. They changed the name, right, when it transferred to Broadway. It, had, it started as a Hamilton mixtape. So I had gone in for Lynn like several times. And the other thing that's hard about it for me is I'm not, a, I, I didn't grow up on hip hop. I grew up on jazz and I grew up on like rock, right? Like Rolling Stones and the Beatles and all these bands I love. But like hip hop was just, I didn't have an in. So I, you know, I was like, great. Well, Hamilton, yay, it's cool. Um, and uh, everybody was, you know, dying over this show. And then they were going to transfer to Broadway. And I remember Motown, the tour, had this grand idea of coming back to Broadway. And uh, when they announced that, we were all like, why? Nobody's asking for Motown to be back on Broadway. Like, it's, we did it. It's done. But they wanted it. Barry Gordy wanted to bring it back. And we're like, great. They did not advertise. So we got back. And, you know, usually when you do a press day for a new show, your press day is in like a massive big old studio where all the reporters from, you know, the Times and the, you know, the Herald, whatever, come in and they, you know, they're taking pictures. 
our press day was in a studio, maybe four times the size of this studio that I'm in here with, with for 60 actors and 30 press. So I knew automatically that we were going to close. I was like, this show is not going to run. <laughs> so I called my agent that day. I was like, yo, I need another job because my wedding is still coming up. And he was like, well, Hamilton's calling again. They want to see you. Again. I was like, I truly do not want to go in for the show again. I'm so sick of hearing about the show. He's like, yes, but they're just, they just got to Broadway. They need uh, another cast member. Do you want to go in? I was like, fine. So I'm working on these sides, these audition sides for Hamilton. And um, again, having a hard time with it because the whole thing is hip hop. I'm not a hip hop guy, but I was a Shakespeare major. And my buddy was like, yo, well, I know that, I know you're not a hip hop guy, but again, this is just like Shakespeare. It's just heightened verse. It's all it is. And then I was like, oh yeah. And then I booked it. I got in and that was cool. Um, Hamilton was really a life changing moment. And I, and I don't, I, I didn't realize in the moment, right? Cause you knew, right? Because I, you know, you know that you're a part of something, you know that you're doing something big. But again, the, the reach that Hamilton has has never been achieved by a Broadway show before, ever. 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 And, and all, especially a Broadway show that is literally just people of color. It's just us. I mean, like, it, that's the point. So all of a sudden, I'm getting Instagram followers. I'm doing interviews. Like, all of a sudden, things just accelerate at this crazy speed. Um, and then they, you know, at that point, I was understudying uh, Aaron Burr and George Washington. And they asked me if I wanted to put my hat in the ring to take over as Aaron Burr. And I was like, I mean, sure. I'll, I will do it. I'll do my best. And then they, I remember that entire, because it wasn't like a re-audition. I was already in the show. But every time that I would go on for Aaron Burr, which, by the way, for understudies, that if anybody is interested in doing that, um, understudies go on often, more often than you would think, because it's just like a regular nine to five. Actors get sick, actors get hurt, right? It's 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 literally like it's literally like you're you know you're you're on the bench at like at like a football game. Like you you are you are there to make sure the game goes, make sure it keeps happening. So I have been. It's a very hard job, um, and every time that I would go on as Aaron Burr. Like Lynn would pop in and be like, hey man, I'm just here checking you out. Like no big deal, whatever. Or like Jeffrey, our producer would pop in. Hey man, just want to see blah, blah, blah. It's all this very, a lot of pressure happening. I'm like, this is weird. But then they called me and I got it. Um, and my life even changed even more. And now I'm doing Aaron Burr and I'm doing this show eight shows a week. And I am terrified because this is one of the hardest roles ever written. And... It is my name right below the title. I have to sustain this. And also on top of that, Hamilton, doing Hamilton is like, and I've talked to Jeremy about this, but it's, it's truly like a, it's like playing a sport. I mean, your body goes through so much. If you've ever seen, if, you, if any of you watched the sheet, have seen the show live, or if you saw it um, on the Disney Plus movie, it, it is nonstop motion, jumping off of the tables, running up and down stairs, rapping, fighting, crying, like you're just, at, you're literally pushing your, your body and mind and soul to the limit for three hours. And I was, I, I was convinced that I was not enough to sustain it. And I, I, I tricked myself. I convinced myself, but I had a really amazing team of people who taught me that I was enough. And that was my friends in the show. I also learned the value of stretching. I don't know if any of you guys are, are doing stretching right now, but for the love of Jesus, stretch, please stretch, do yoga, do something. Cause you just, you, you, all of a sudden you start to understand that like your body is a machine, right? And it needs to be warmed up and it needs to be cooled down. And, and I was able to do these things that like, I truly did not think I could do. Um, so Hamilton, Hamilton pushed me in a lot of ways and Hamilton, set me up um, in a crazy way. I went out on tour as Aaron Burr. 
And then I came back and now I'm, I'm leading um, the show called Ain't Too Proud, which is right back to Motown about the Temptations, much better show, um, much, much better show directed by Dez, who started my career. Um, so it's this very full circle thing, guys. Um, but yeah, the I think the biggest thing I can say is, is that you have to trust that you are worthy of it. There's going to be so many things and people who tell you that you're not, and and your own mind, your mind will fight you on every on all of it, and and your mind will tell you, well, I can't do that because I don't have the access to that, and I can't, I can't, I, I don't, I don't know where to research that. But all you have to do is ask, right? You have amazing teachers. You have people who can who can help point you in the right direction. And, and also not to wait, right? Because I think the other part of it too is it's not about going to the most amazing school at all, especially for those of you who want to make films, right? And I'm sure you're already doing this, but remember like you literally have a camera on your phone. Like you have a camera and you have iMovie on your phone. You can make movies. I mean, like there's nothing stopping you. And I think remembering that like my mom is, you know, my mom's a preacher now. And she, uh, one of her favorite scriptures, I'm going to forget which chapter it's from, but it's essentially paraphrasing, uh, hone your craft and the world will make a space. And that's what I say to you, like, trust that you have everything you need to do what you need to do. And trust that whatever you want to create is worth seeing. It's worth seeing. Nobody's going to tell, I think the thing, the, the lesson that I've learned you know as i as i because now i'm trying i'm writing and i'm doing my i'm producing my own work and and the, you know lynn talks about this all the time is just that that thing of like nobody is going to tell your story until you tell it right it's literally waiting on you um so yeah that's you know I, oh my god i talked for too too long too long guys um but but that's kind of where where i where i stand on the whole thing and and i I just want to impart that to you that that it really it is a journey and it is not easy being in the arts is not easy but it is worth it because you are worth it you know so yeah so if there's any questions that you have in these last couple of minutes i would love to take them i think i think we got to a couple of them in the chat but feel free to to throw any others in the chat or we can just or we can just sit here and just look at your amazing you know amazing handles um and the other thing I will say is if you want to ask any more, I, I will put my Instagram handle in the chat. Feel free to DM me. Like I don't, I don't, I don't ignore DMs. I don't, whatever. Like I, I, I try to keep them open as much as I can because I, I just enjoy helping people uh, with this kind of stuff. So, you know, feel free to hit me up, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's, that's what I got to say y'all. Oh, can I get your email? Uh, go, go through my DM, go through my DM for sure. Um, and if you have a question that you want to email, just ask Jeremy for ask Jeremy, and uh, he can get it to me. Cool, cool, cool. Anybody else? We good? All right, y'all. What's your favorite play you did? Probably Hamilton. Probably Hamilton. Least, what's the least favorite? Ooh, that's a toughie. Uh, um, see, I would say I would say Motown, but Motown was, but I I learned so much from Motown, like like uh, yeah. Um, oh, here's some questions coming in. Uh, but in answer to your question, okay, it wasn't a play; it was a reading. I did a reading of a play that was truly trash, and we were all like sitting there, like, "Yo, this is." terrible this is a bad this is just a bad play um i'm gonna have to ask you later what show that was <laughs> oh i'll tell you i'll tell you exactly this uh do you have a plan b for a career so here's the i, I want to talk about this okay because this is actually very important um i want to talk about the concept of plan b's when you're going into the arts because the thing that we live in a and this is not in any way demeaning our society, but we live in a capitalist society. We live in a society that tells you that to be successful in society, you have to make X amount of money and you have to do this and you have to be on this and be and like, 
if you're an actor and you're not on Broadway or you're not in movies or TV, you're not a successful actor. That is a lie. I want to tell you right now, that is a lie. And so I want, if I can offer your advice, it would be to think of it less as a plan B, more as how do I protect my joy today? Now, I have done this for a long time. Um, I make good money doing this. Right now, I have built enough of a name for myself that there is, there is a price that I do not, that my name does not go below, right? And that's, that's because I've worked to do it. So I don't, I don't know. I don't, in answer to your question, I don't do a plan B. There's no plan B for my career. That said, when I was starting out, it wasn't about plan B. It was finish Yoshimi. I had a red carpet opening. I had all this press, all this amazing stuff, and I finished, and now I'm unemployed again. So what do I need to do to pay my bills that night? What do I need to do to, to, to feed myself, right? Because these are the basic things, keeping the lights on, keeping, keeping yourself warm, keeping yourself fed. Those are basic things you need to do no matter what. So it, I, would just, I would just offer up that like plan B, if, if you want to go into the arts, go into the arts and don't let anything stop you. The things that you do in between those times are the things you do in between the times. It's not a plan B. Do you know what I mean? You, you make it work because the truth of the matter is the career that you've signed up for, whether you're a filmmaker, uh, an actor, a writer, a director, a dancer, the work, the work can be inconsistent. You know, it can be, it can be from gig to gig inconsistent. So you, you want to just know that like, there's no shame in having other things to do, but don't call it a plan B because you're, you're an artist. That's what I say. You're an artist. And I, I, I hate, I hate the concept like, oh, I failed. So I have to go back to this job. It's not that. That's not what's happening. This is a very, very hard career. There's like 1% of us who are in this career who are working. You know what I mean? So that, that means something. Um, how much motivation do you have to have to, when you face your hard challenges? A lot. A lot of meditation, a lot of prayer, a lot of journaling, a lot of, um, a lot of crying. I mean, there's been, there's been some really hard nights, guys. Like I'm not, I, I would never lie to you. Um, this is tough. This is a super, super tough career. Um, so you had to, I think that what it was for me, the, the biggest thing I will say for me, I, I learned very quickly how to treat myself right. So let's say I go to an audition, I get to the final, final thing. It just happened. Um, I, I was, I was up for a TV show filming out in New York, but I'm in California right now. And because of COVID, they're not comfortable casting people from other states. So like I got like, it was literally like, we're about to sign the contract and they're like, oh wait, but he's in California. Insurance can't cover it. And it's like, are you kidding me? So I have my, I have my, 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 my favorite pack, like my snack pack. It's a dirty chai from this one specific cafe and uh, a croissant, which, right. And it's very delicious. And I get that. And that's like my, okay. And it doesn't cost, it costs $5. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not like big, I don't have to get like a five star steak. Like you just, what makes you happy in that moment? And I think being kind to yourself is a huge thing that helps you other than just the motivation. Uh, what was it like touring and did it get boring to the same show every night? Touring is interesting. Touring is like, especially on a show like Hamilton, touring is crazy because you are literally opening Hamilton in a different city every two to three months. So Opening Hamilton in New York was massive. Now imagine that multiplied by X amount of cities. So what I loved about touring was I got to see the best of these cities. Do you mean I got, got this, I, these cities opened to me and I, I got to see the city from a point of view that was like, they had given me the key. Um, got very, very lonely, right? Because my, the role that I played, I couldn't, you know, Aaron Burr, if, it's the, if you're playing Aaron Burr, you're playing Hamilton, like, you are your life is owned by that role so like i i would do the show and like a lot of my cast members would go out and like party every night and whatever i was right to bed i was sleeping i was i was at the gym the next morning at 8 a.m and then i'm up i'm eating i'm eating like you know i have i have my you know it's like it's like anybody who's doing any fitness regimen you have your cheat day right where you're eating your your pizza and your burgers and whatever else you want to eat but then mostly you're eating like pretty healthy 
right? Because you have to you have to fit into the costumes and, and like they'll you know not that they won't like let the costumes out or adjust to whatever your body does because that's what bodies do. But you want to at least it's not about what you look like; it's about you being in the best shape so that you can do this show every night, right? It's it it has nothing to do with like you know how much you weigh or anything like that. It's literally just like I need to know that I have the power to do what I need to do. Um, so in that, it was like crazy, but it was also, I mean, you also figure out some amazing tricks. Like, so I would, you know, cause the, the, the company is flying you everywhere. Um, uh, right. Uh, so, so you, you can, they'll, they'll pick the flights for you, but what I did, and this is, if anybody tours or if anybody, you know, is, is doing, ends up doing something like this, you can remember, I told you this pick your favorite airline. And then the, what I used to do is I used to say, hey, the money that you're going to spend on that plane ticket, just give that to me and I'm going to buy it on Delta. I only flew Delta and I only, when I was staying in a hotel, I only stayed at Marriott. So now I have points up the wazoo. My entire, my entire honeymoon was paid for with points. And like, it's a whole thing. It's crazy. But like you, I, I really am proud. Like, it's a very silly thing to be proud of, but I'm proud of my points. I'm very proud of my points. Um, then the question, this is a good conversation, different, which gives it idea. Oh, well, thank you, Danielle. I'm glad, I'm glad you enjoyed this. Um, but yeah, guys, I mean, it, it really is, uh, oh, and did it get boring? No, it didn't get boring because the show is so hard, right? The show is so hard. And also because think of, think of acting in a Broadway show, like, uh, like you're the owner of a restaurant. Okay. So there's the menu, the set, the menu is set, right? The difference is you're not getting the same customers every night, right? Just because table A loved the 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 duck l'orange doesn't mean, I don't know what duck l'orange is. I just know it's a thing, by the way. Just because they love the duck l'orange doesn't mean that all of a sudden table B is like, oh yeah, well, they love the duck l'orange. So I don't need to, you know, like you have to keep that level of excellence up night after night. So that's the challenge. So it, it yes, it does get, by rote, but then you remember like, yeah, okay, I, I maybe am feeling a little bored or out of it today. I've said these lines at this point 2000 times. However, there are people in the audience who could not afford it and yet paid between 300 and 800 dollars per seat to see me this evening. And that's in a, in an auditorium or theater of 3000 people. So doing the math really quickly, $800 times 3000. Do you mean that's that's a lot of that's a lot of people's hard-earned money to come see you do this, you know? And 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 people, and especially when you're going to cities that aren't aren't New York, aren't LA, some of these, you know, Omaha, Tulsa, these amazing cities, but where people literally have saved all year to purchase this ticket. So I'm not gonna give them any less of a show because I'm bored. Do you mean that's my job? That's why they're paying me, is to keep the show interesting for them. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Well, guys, it's been it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, and and I hope I hope you learned. I hope there's something. I hope that, you know something got in there. I don't know, um, but you know, it's it the arts in general is is a beautiful career. Um, it has given me so many gifts and taught me so much about myself, and I I hope that anybody interested in it continues to 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 look at doing it because it. Again, for every bit of heartache that it is, it is also truly one of the best things you could do with your life. So, yeah. There you go. Thank you so much, Nick. And uh, can we have everybody, if you can put cameras on or at least mics off for a, a big thank you to Mr. Nick for coming thank you. straight off of a flight to this. Thank Did everybody you. see Hamilton when it was thank on? You. I mean, were you on the thank television you. version of Hamilton? Because I no. didn't get to see it. So when they were so when they were when they were filming that I was just coming into the show. Okay. Okay. So I, I just missed it by like literally a day. But Oh good. I'm glad I didn't see it. So. <laughs> well, when is Ain't Too Proud coming on? Ain't Too Proud. I mean, so we've been doing if you've been watching if you watch Macy's Day, we performed on Macy's Day. We mm -hmm. did uh, we did we just did the Christmas tree lighting. We did a we did a special with Whoopi Goldberg uh, back in October. I'll actually put that in the, in, in the chat for, for if you want to see it. Um, and then we're, I mean, we're coming back. We're trying to be one of the first shows back. So they've, you know, this is kind of not known information, but they have, 
Broadway is very much in the works of getting getting back to to doing what we do, um, and they have asked me to be back um, in New York by I think midsummer. So we will see what that entails. I'm just copying and pasting this real quick. Do do do. All right, copy and paste cool you have an so, yeah. amazing voice i found a clip of course not of hamilton you know that things like oh, that but yeah. i found a clip of you um i'm trying to see where it is wait i want to see if i can share but like just for a few seconds and i'm thinking oh my gosh i'm we're gonna have to when COVID is over we're gonna have to go and see you somehow maybe you'll yeah. be back in pittsburgh there's a reason that i've known this guy for oh, almost 20 sure. years and we've only done karaoke together twice <laughs> oh, there's a and i went before him okay there's, i don't know you know what i don't think my sound is on i'm sorry um that's okay let me but i, I yes. was in can you all did hear you, did you do share sound on the screen the share of course i didn't hold on <laughs> Can I just say, everybody, the really obnoxious thing is that he sounded that good forever. So it's like, I thought I was, you know, all the stuff. I was all that and a bag of Ruffles potato chips. And then I heard this kid sing and I went, I'm going to be a teacher. <laughs> but I will say, just as a closing statement, and I'm not, you know, just blowing sunshine here because I don't do that to our guests or to you all, our CEOs, but the amount of not just motivation, but discipline. And we talk a lot, I know, probably more than you guys want to talk about it, about the difference between motivation and discipline. Um, but um, Mr. Nick is one of those people where he, uh, he refuses to rest on his laurels, you know, no matter how many times people say he's awesome or how many roles he gets, he is always improving um, and always pushing himself to be the best version of himself. And Honestly, it's been a huge inspiration to me to follow my passion, which is working with working with students and working with you all. Um, so I just want to remind you that if you have a passion, even if it's not the arts, right? I mean, a lot of people think about passion and drive and a calling as being, you know, a kind of uh, not relegated, but only for people with artistic pursuits. I can tell you that passion and waking up 
thrilled to do your job every day is something that can come from a lot of places you might not expect. Um, and it's how I feel. Um, and I, I hope that regardless of what your, your calling is, that you dedicate yourselves to it. And just like Mr. Nick said, you know, don't make a plan B, make, yeah. remake your plan to make your plan A a reality. You know, be flexible. Like we always say, like Ms. Carla always says, you know, prepare yourself um, and be flexible and be prepared to kind of pivot. Um, and uh, in, in the spirit of founding fathers, uh, however dubiously uh, awesome they might be from a historical perspective, um, Thomas Jefferson once said, luck is a wonderful thing. And I find the harder I work, the more I have of it. So the harder you work, the better, the better chance you have of being in the position to make your dream a reality. So thank you for everything, Mr. Nick. This is wonderful. Thank you. Of course, if, if, and if there's one thing I also just want to end on before I leave, get the idea of failure out of your head. Yes. And I don't, I don't mean, I don't mean like, oh, you know, like I have to succeed. I mean, be kind to yourself. There's so many, I think the other lie they tell you is that because we are coming from a different place, right? We, our boundaries for failure are that much more narrow. They're not, they're not, we're human. Do you mean some days we have off days? That doesn't mean the whole thing is over. Right. Do you mean allow yourself to have the, just be, just because it's not perfect that day doesn't mean it's not perfect. Just be kind to yourself, you know, no failure. When you were performing with the Christmas lighting in New York, and the Temptations yeah. were in those white suits. Were you yeah. one of them? Yeah. That was, that that was, was me, yeah. so fat. I loved it. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you enjoyed it. I'm so I glad. I loved that whole program. It was beautiful. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah, that's literally where I just flew in from. Oh, wow. that's yeah, it was wonderful. I loved it. Yeah. Oh, so glad. So glad. Well, guys, you are the best. Um, you know, Jeremy has my info, so so just talk to him and get to me, and we'll talk. But yeah. all my love to all of you guys. All right. Thank, Thank you so, so much, much. We wish you so well in your performances and in your future. And, you. and keep us in mind. You know, we, we'd love to have you back someday. Of course. You got it. Thank you. And Sarah, my best, Nick. Bye, Mr. Bye. 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 Bye.